welcome to Data and Society. Um, my name is Janet Haven. Um, I am the executive director here at Data and Society, and it is my sincere pleasure to see all of you here tonight. Um, I'd like to welcome you to our Data Byte tonight, featuring Yashima Bet Milner, um, the founder and executive director of Data for Black Lives. Yashi is an Echoing Green Black Male Achievement Fellow and Ashoka Fellow and joins the founders of Black Lives Matter and Occupy Wall Street in the distinguished inaugural class of Roddenberry Foundation Fellows. Most recently, she was named one of Forbes 30 Under 30. Yashi has a BA from Brown University and serves on the board of the historic Highlander Center for Research and Education. I am extremely delighted to welcome her tonight to the stage. Thank you. Thanks, Janet. And thank you everyone for being here and for braving an impending like public health crisis. You know, this is my very first public uh, abolish big data talk in New York City, and there's no place I would rather do it than right here. So about Data for Black Lives, um, Data for Black Lives is a movement of over 4,000 scientists and activists committed to harnessing the power of data and technology to make concrete and measurable change in the lives of black people. And Data for Black Lives began with a vision, my vision, a bold, ambitious, but very possible vision of changing the role that data plays in society, in public life, in the lives of historically oppressed people, and in particular, the lives of black people. We launched Data for Black Lives with a conference at the MIT Media Lab in November of 2017, and nearly three years in, the vision has grown into a powerful force of scientists and activists, equipped with the skills, empathy, and the ability to create a new blueprint for the future. And we are continuing to grow. This year, we're responding to the urgency of the political moment, but also the request of people all over the US and the globe to bring the data for Black Lives Mission where they live. The mission, to make data a tool for social change instead of a weapon of political oppression. This talk is entitled Abolish Big Data. It's the name of my forthcoming book. It is also a call to action that recognizes that the bullets, police dogs, and fire hoses of the past have become the predictive policing algorithms, data-driven voter suppression, and the facial recognition of the present. Algorithms and other big data technologies are the engines facilitating the evolution of chattel slavery into the prison industrial complex and have created the conditions for the crisis we face now. The prison abolition movement asked the question, how do we create solutions in our communities to social problems without recourse to prisons? In this talk, I apply that lens to big data. How can we reimagine the structures and industries that concentrate big data into the hands of a few? And how can we abolish the structures that turn data into a powerful and deadly weapon? This is not a call uh, to end the use of all data, quite the opposite. The call to abolish prisons is not a, end, a call to end uh, and abolish accountability, but to abolish a punitive, violent system that is simply not working for society. The call to abolish, to abolish big data is to dismantle the oppressive structures and the industries that surround its use. Big data is more than a collection of technologies, a vast amount of information and different types of it. It is more than a revolution in prediction and measurement. It has become a philosophy, an ideological regime about how decisions are made and who makes them. It has given legitimacy to a new form of social and political control that has taken the digital artifacts of our existence and found new ways to use them against us. Big data is not new. It's not as novel or as revolutionary as we often worship it to be. It is part of a long and pervasive history, historical legacy, and a technological timeline of scientific oppression, aggressive public policy, and the most influential political and economic system that continues to shape our country and our economy, which is chattel slavery. I believe today what we face and what we must name is a data industrial complex, where zip code is destiny, debt, becomes a ball and chain weaponized by complex and obscure financial systems, 
where data is a strategy to rob people of political power by manipulating elections. A system and culture where persistent, archaic and racist notion of risk persist, narratives more powerful and impenetrable than any prison cell that's ever been built. Data for Black Lives was founded on the belief that we have an opportunity with data to abolish, reimagine, and recreate new structures of knowledge production, new structures of knowledge production, new forms of decision making, and new ways of relating to each other. The possibilities for this are infinite. Because of the enormity of the threat, which is scary and unprecedented, the discourse has been very negative and fatalistic, but this does not reflect the agencies of our communities and our movements. We don't want people to give up and get overwhelmed. We want to create alternatives. Once again, to abolish big data in the most simplest terms means to reject, this, reject the structures that concentrate the power of data into hands of a few, and instead put that power into the hands of people who need it the most. The possibilities of that shift became very clear to me at a young age. I learned to collect, analyze, and use data as a high school student because early on I realized that alone we could be ignored, but that there was power in a number. When students at a nearby high school organized a peaceful protest after a, a school administrator put another student in a chokehold, it made national news, but not in the way that young people walking out over gun violence or other forms of civil disobedience would today. I'll never forget seeing footage of SWAT teams flooding into the school, of police shoving the small frames of students I grew up with against police cars. On CNN and on local news like shown here, the headlines read, riot at Miami Edison Senior High School. I knew that unless we found new ways to be heard, to disrupt the narratives that facilitated this level of abuse, my future and the future of many other young people would be at stake. When we were turned away from public hearings at the school board and totally dismissed by administration, we hit the ground running. We surveyed over 600 students about their experiences with suspensions and arrests in schools, and we turned the findings into a comic book. For many of the young people we surveyed, uh, this was their first time ever being asked about uh, their experiences. For them, they thought that you know, not having a school ID or getting suspended for having the wrong color t-shirt under their uniform meant that they were a bad kid. But they did not know that, you know, what we were facing was a statewide problem, was a, it was a national problem, and it was called the school to prison pipeline. And most importantly, that there were young people in the city who were working um, to change that, to shift that with something called restorative justice. Four years later, I returned to Miami after college with a renewed sense of purpose um, and an arsenal of skills in data science and data collection and research that was urgently needed. I went to Brown, and I see some of my Brown uh, classmates here. We had open curriculum, so you know that, that you could just do whatever you wanted, and I took full advantage of that. <laughs> you know, but, but I said, okay, how can I get as much skills as possible, and how can I bring it back to Miami? And I had an opportunity. I was asked to come back to lead a campaign um, at, the, at the same organization, Power You, but this one was on uh, re reproductive justice. Um, folks in the community saw that there was a crisis happening. Black babies were three times more likely to die before their first birthday than white babies. Um, you know, and even though at that point in 2012, 2013, it's shifted a little bit now, um, there was very little research on this phenomenon around black infant mortality. The fact that the, the infant mortality rates had you know, you know, decreased for the past 50 years, but that disparity had stayed the same. Moms in the community knew, families knew that. In particular, when you go into the hospital, people were experiencing things like the overuse of uh, uh, procedures like C-section and the aggressive targeting and marketing of infant formula, just in addition to a whole host of bedside practices that made going to give birth a very kind of like violent and racist experience. So, you know, but without data, um, and in a political climate like Miami, um, community was totally ignored. So with a small team of moms, I surveyed 
300 women and families about their experiences giving birth in Jackson Memorial Hospital, which is our public hospital and the largest public hospital in the country. And we weren't able to bring 300 moms into the boardroom with us once we got to meet with the hospital CEO and the staff, but they couldn't deny the data that we collected. A campaign that would have taken years to win, we accomplished within months. And today, the lives of hundreds of thousands of mothers um, and babies have been impacted by the changes made in the hospitals um, that we fought for. But in all of these experiences, whether it was growing up or what we were facing with this campaign, I realized that we weren't just fighting institutions whose policies and practices sought to undermine our lives, but behind those policies and practices, what justified and endorsed these civil and human rights abuses were narratives. Narratives grounded in data that must, that must also be abolished while we do the work of dismantling the power structures that perpetuate them. Perhaps the most harmful narratives surround the notion of risk. The very first time I heard the term at risk was actually in the fourth grade. Another student, and coincidentally, as we worked in our school's computer lab, told me that she was at risk. You know, immediately just hearing the word as a, as a nine-year-old like elicited this sense of fear in me, like, at risk of what? Are you okay? What's going on? I asked her what she meant. She told me that she was enrolled in an after-school program for at-risk students, for kids who were at risk of joining a gang or um, having an unwanted pregnancy, of dying early. She liked the after-school program, um, and it was but it was as if the lack of funding at our under-resourced, predominantly black school um, offered limited options, not just for the extracurricular activities that were possible, but also for the kind of lives and for who we could become as people. And this was a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? You know, I survived the school to prison pipeline, but many of my peers did not, as they had to fight to overcome these mis the material circumstances of their life in addition to the weight of these narratives. And so my question is, you know, how does this word risk, right, which is used, you know, first used in like in, in actuarial science and in, and in business become applied to a whole generation of young people um, then when I was growing up and now. But you know, this is one of my favorite uh, forms of machine learning um, used to power autocorrect and word editing and synonyms. Um, in most text editing softwares. And in this, we see connotations of risk, right? Danger, jeopardy, um, probability, gamble, hazard. But again, how do these words become used and not only used, but operationalized through policy um, that affected young people like myself and my friend? And you know, there's a historical basis for this, right? With the end of the civil rights movement, the war on drugs, or as what I call the war on communities, and with the introduction of massive legislation to push forward the most violent civil and human rights assaults of our lifetime, mass, incar mass incarceration, also came a wave of research and data that targeted um, black communities and communities of color and sought to warehouse these communities into prisons. And this, you know, the super predator myth, I think it got prime time during the last election, but I think unfortunately the conversation was isolated to particular candidates, but wasn't really a broader conversation around how this myth is still persistent. But, you know, this was introduced by a social, social scientist and Bush administration advisor, John DeLulio, in 1995. He created a whole theory around this idea of super predators. A new generation of criminal, street criminals is upon us, and I quote, the youngest, biggest, and baddest generation anyone has ever seen. Based on all that we have witnessed, researched, and heard from people who are close to the action, he wrote with two, with two co-authors, here is what we believe. America is now home to thickening ranks of juvenile super predators, radically impulsive, brutally remorseless youngsters, including ever more teenage boys who murder, assault, rape, rob, burglarize, deal deadly drugs, join gangs, and create serious communal disorders. At the core, the problem is that most inner city children grow up surrounded by teenagers and adults who are themselves deviant, delinquent, or criminal. And the point of this was to spark panic, to fuel this fear and hatred into tough on crime policies that proved successful for its objective to criminalize generations of young people. But it took years for him to admit what we all know now, 
um, that there was never a, a threat at all, and that his predictions were not only wrong, but they were the exact opposite of what was happening across the nation. Years after this article, um, you know, after this kind of campaign of lies, and once he, you know, he talks about converting back to Catholicism, um, but he actually retracts all the statements that he made. But by then, it was too late, right? The policies were already in motion, and they became automated in the American imagination. And John DeLulia was not alone. This is another famous myth, crack baby myth, that was based on, on a study with only 23 participants, right? If there's researchers in here, you know that that's not enough sample size to actually pull any like valid findings. But again, with a whole bunch of media support and a lot of um, you know, political endorsement, you know, this became such a persistent um, ideological regime, but also fueled so much policy. And later on, you know, New York Times followed up with the original people who were part of the study, and one of the, the young ladies was the first in her family to graduate from college. And the findings were clear, right? The biggest, you know, risk factor or whatever for, um, you know, these, these, these children was not crack addiction, not even race, right? It was poverty, right? And there's also this welfare queen myth that has been used to totally privatize and dismantle our social systems. Meanwhile, we know that the real, the real welfare queens are the ones who benefit more, um, are, are the corporations who benefit more from government subsidies um, than any individual represents, representatives and recipients combined. You know, but so in the age of big data, Unless we are aware of this history, we risk repeating it. And I think that's a much more appropriate term of the use risk. But before we can talk about algorithms and these specific big data systems, we have to tell the origin story of big data. What were the economic, imperialistic, and colonial context that re required the level of record keeping, accounting, and surveillance that have come to define the big data practices of today? Contrary to popular belief, slavery was not the antithesis to business innovation. And much of what we know about scientific management, management science, and finance does not come from the factory floor, the railroad, or the steam engine. The big data systems we are familiar with today used to control, surveil, and enact violence to maintain power structures and ensure profit on a global scale originated during slavery. In the 1600s and 1700s, the Dutch East and West India companies were the largest commercial enterprises in the world, with thousands of ships, hundreds of offices and employees all across the Americas and Asia. The VOC and the WOC's operations were mirrored all over the Atlantic and brought to the US. In proportional terms, they were wealthier and more powerful than Apple, Google, and Facebook combined. These companies pioneered colonialism, created the blueprint for globalization, and developed new data practices required to maintain this massive operation. And although this history has been largely erased and, and ignored, these sophisticated big data practices predate the analytical tools that we use today. Big data practices were not engineered out of creativity or innovation, but in the deeply violent transatlantic slave trade which trafficked 12.5 million enslaved African people to the Americas. In a great book that I think you guys should all read, um, Dr. Caitlin Rosenthal writes, um, she wrote uh, Accounting for Slavery, Masters in Management, that planters' control over enslaved people made it easier for them to fit their slaves, enslaved African people, into neat empirical rows and columns. The abstraction of catastrophic loss of human life and the necessary torture required to maintain plantations was needed to serve the owners who were removed from the daily abuse of the literal rows and fields of cotton, of the cotton, sugar, and, plant, and tobacco plantations they owned. Data moved up and down hierarchies, akin to the ways in which CEOs and boards today are responsible for, but never accountable to the violence that they inflict. Big data was necessary to distance oneself from the gore capitalism and violence of slavery. So these are actually standardized reports um, 
that were used on a daily basis and are really reflective of the record keeping practices of the Dutch Empire um, and can be seen in other countries. This is actually from a plantation called Hope and Experiment um, in you know, British Guyana where my family is from and were enslaved. And it really hits home because of how close it is to me, but also how much, how just eerily similar it looks to some of the charts and maps and, 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 and um, you know, the documents that we use today. So in it, there was one, one line for each day with columns for the many different categories of enslaved women, men and children, and they include in the field, watchmen, house servants, carpenters, uh, invalids, runaways. And children's labor was, was actually very much essential to the operations of the, of the plantation and their role justified by the brutal logic of capitalism. And I quote one slave owner, the, Negro, the hand of a Negro child is best calculated to extract weed and grass. This daily process of dehumanization was deeply numerical. And below these monthly abstracts were ideal, literally below this were ideal reports for livestock. The Negro account and the livestock account use the same methods of taking an inventory, calculating increase, decrease, purchase, sale, birth, death, slaughter, with very little difference made from man, woman, child, ox, and goat, and cattle. But the most necessary form of accounting was in the wielding of information as a weapon to create fear, distrust, and to neutralize collective action amongst enslaved people. From re removing verses of, of the Bible that rejected slavery and using whipping, amputation, and torture to ensure that no one could read, write, or communicate at all. Keeping track of weapons, that was another important data collection practice, right? Just to make sure no one was taking something and starting a, you know, a revolt. Information systems developed were created with the intention of eclipsing networks that allowed enslaved people to assert their strength in numbers, to become educated and informed, to organize and to fight back. All of these examples, and, and many more too, trust me, wait for the book, indicate the ways in which big data was born out of bondage. To emphasize my point earlier, big data is not as new or as innovative as we often see it to be, um, but it's really part of this long and pervasive history. Um, we often say that no algorithm is neutral, that algorithms are opinions embedded in code, and this history reveals the extent that which is, to which that is true. And for those who don't know, I'm sure people, most people here know, but by definition, an algorithm, in a very brief way, is a set of step-by-step -step instructions to solve a problem. One example that I love to use is that you know, a recipe is an algorithm. It's a list of instructions to make a dish, ingredients that make up a dish, and a result. Based on what we define from the beginning of the recipe as success, whether we want to focus on making something that is healthy or something that tastes good, regardless of health benefits, these decisions are determined by a question. What are we optimizing? Computational algorithms are layered, complicated. Their ingredients are not just raw data that is fed into them, and the result is not as simple as the outputs that come out of them. Scores, ratios, GPS routes, and Netflix recommendations. But as this chart demonstrates, history and values are what influence inputs and outputs, and most importantly, the very models that are trained and developed, the algorithms themselves. One example that I love to use, especially when I'm talking to different groups of people, uh, regardless of the, you know, what, their, what kind of work they do, is that it's, it's FICO scores, right? You know, contrary to popular belief, you know, FICO is not a federal agency. I'm sure you all, I hope you all know, but it's the Fair Isaac and Company, a for-profit entity started by William Fair and Earl Isaac, a mathematician and an engineer who 25 years ago sought to disrupt the risk and lending industry through the use of machine learning. The inputs to the FICO algorithm, as we are told, are the amount of debt we have, the, the percentage of missed payments, uh, et cetera, and this information, our data, is provided through the collusion of data brokers, Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion. And that is fed into this FICO algorithm and we get our score. And while we are told that certain behaviors and financial characteristics make up our credit scores, we're never really able to verify because FICO is a proprietary algorithm, a black box devoid of transparency with the purpose of displacing accountability away from these for-profit companies for, the, for, the, for that profit from our data at will and at our expense.
And FICO scores reflect the ways in which algorithms hold tremendous power over our lives. Right at this very moment, I know students who will have to drop out of school because they can't qualify for subsidized student loans. People struggling to afford rising public transportation costs here and all over the country um, because they can't afford subprime car payments and, tra and affordable transportation. And even hardworking families right here in this city who are facing homelessness because they can't qualify to rent an apartment, all because of a three-digit number. And these three three-digit numbers will increasingly decide whether we should get hired for the job, and even someday, if we do not resist, whether or not we have the right to attain citizenship or be deported. And while it is in a violation of federal law to deny people housing, employment, and education based on race, you can't sue an algorithm. And private companies like FICO, who I must also mention, um, it is in their best interest to make sure that some people have low scores and some don't, argue that their algorithms don't discriminate. They say nowhere in their algorithm or in their inputs is race a variable. But we know that based on the history of this country, how our neighborhoods and municipalities are organized, you don't need to use race as a variable. With redlining and segregation, the legacy of slavery, one of the many legacies of slavery, have made zip codes proxies for race. Only several generations after slavery, over six million African Americans left the South for the industrial centers of the North, Northeast, Midwest, and West Coast of this country in what was known as the Great Black Migration. As white people contributed tremendously to the growth of the manufacturing industry and to the culture and politics of metropolitan life, our federal government responded through policies that sought to institutionalize racist sentiments and permanently entrench black communities in a caste-like stat caste status. Policies that were foregrounded in the most essential part of economic mobility, home ownership. In 1933, as part of the, of the New Deal, the Homeowners Loan Corporation developed a grading system that deemed some areas desirable while others hazardous. It, it did not matter that federal law had ruled that uh, racial zoning was unconstitutional at that point, but the creation of security maps and the redlining of black communities encouraged the practices of real estate boards, neighborhood association, and white mob violence that made it impossible for black people to own homes. According to NDB Colony, um, a historian, neighborhood grading during the 1930s was hardly a science, but the program's scientific trappings helped turn popular racial knowledge into real world consequences. And this is a map of Miami where I'm from and you know, uh, according to the NCRC, 74% um, of the areas that were deemed hazardous, given a D grade, in 1933 remain low income, under-resourced, and neglected communities of today, and over-policed, I might add. So zip codes created in the 20th century to organize a country for the postal service have actually also become artifacts of this history, extending the shelf life of racist public policies of the past. And I'm sure you all, I hope you all are familiar with this amazing study by ProPublica where they looked at um, how zip codes were essential to the insurance industry's um, predatory practices where someone living in a commercial area downtown Chicago where there's actually more crime um, and driving a sports car, which is more risk, again, according to that the, the actuarial term, um, were um, paying hundreds of dollars less in car insurance and families in working class um, communities in, in Chicago South Side, uh, black and brown communities, although you know they had less expensive cars and, and crime was less prevalent. And if you look at a comparison of the Hulk maps and also the purple where the price is um, higher and more concentrated, um, the, the comparison is actually startling. And, I, and another example, there are so many examples of how zip codes are proxies for race, but I think I like to always talk about um, uh, zip codes in particular because that's one thing that we often use in our research. And you know, I invite folks to really think more critically about it because it really shows, again, not just present discrimination, but historically how that's played out. But again, beyond zip codes, um, there's other examples of how big data perpetuates racism without racist. It's no surprise that uh, the risk assessments are do that um, you know courts are doling out are giving longer sentences to black youth with no prior convictions than white career criminals, as another ProPublica, as this ProPublica study demonstrates, um, another one uh, that, that studies um, the Compass algorithms. 
when companies like Compass use these questions to determine risk. So some of the questions on this Compass um, questionnaire that's, that people fill out, that's fed into the algorithm, are, you know, how many of your friends and acquaintances have ever been arrested? Were you ever suspended or expelled from school? How often have you moved in the last 12 months? Or indicate how much you agree with this statement. Does a hungry person have a right to steal? So I mean, my questions are who's incarcerated in this country? Who's disproportionately suspended? Who overwhelmingly faces housing insecurity and homelessness? And I mean, according to this algorithm, I should be in jail and spent, sentenced and spending time um, and not actually giving this talk to you all today. So for this reason and many others, I really assert the call to abolish big data, to reject and dismantle the structures that concentrate the power of data into the hands of a few, and to put the power into the hands of people who need it the most. The refugee, the activist, the most vulnerable, and the least powerful against the enormity of what we are facing. And given what we know now, I believe that this call to abolish big data is not simply, simply a political choice, um, but it's an ethical obligation. And it's an obligation that's grounded in a critical vision. And this vision is what guides our work. To reclaim data as protest, data as accountability, and data as collective action. And here's some examples, some brief examples of what, what we've been doing. I'm going to talk, talk a little bit more with um, Jan and, and a little bit about some specific programs. But when a coalition of teachers, students, parents, and researchers um, and organizers in the Twin Cities learned that the mayor's office, the sheriff's office, the foster care agency, and the school district were quietly planning a joint powers data sharing agreement to turn private student data and youth data into risk ratios we help them mobilize, right? I was called and asked to go to St. Paul in February because people said, you know, yes, she, our folks don't know what uh, big data is. We don't understand predictive, you know, uh, algorithms, but we know that when they say risk ratios, already in the context of incredible, you know, disparate income disparities and in the place where, you know, Philando Castile was murdered by the police with impunity, that this could only mean something that's bad for our communities and not good. And, you know, by organizing and holding summits and doing strategy and also thinking of alternative policy and ways to, instead of like doing joint data sharing agreements, but to actually listen to the demands that folks had been pushing for way before all this came down, you know, they were able to successfully get the mayor and, and all these agencies to dissolve this plan and are currently working um, with uh, decision makers to, um, again, change the material conditions for folks in that community. And when the news broke that the data of 2.1 billion users um, were used as a, political, as a weapon of political warfare in the 2016 election, we led a bold effort to hold Facebook to a new standard. It was simply not enough to, um, for, Facebook to make, for us to make sure that Facebook never did this again. And I wrote an open letter to Facebook on behalf of the Data for Black Lives movement that laid out three demands. The first, to de develop a code of ethics that researchers and staff at Facebook must uphold in the absence of important accountability protections such as an IRB, right? Anywhere you go, you have to follow IRB standards, any research institution. And when you go on research.facebook.com, it's you know, really amazing how they have like actual like peer review type journal articles um, without the accountability and the human subject consent and all that other stuff that ensures that um, it, there isn't any ethical violations happening. And for us, in the context of like Henrietta Lacks and the Tuskegee Airmen experiments, I mean, all the stuff on the personality quiz and all that stuff, it was just too familiar. And that's why that was one of our main demands. Um, the second was to hire more black data scientists and researchers um, and create an environment for those folks to thrive and not to push them out. And most importantly, the one that we're, that we're focused on now currently is um, to commit de-identified data to a public data trust. And a data trust, by definition, um, is a structure whereby data is placed under the control of a board of trustees who have a fiduciary responsibility to look after the interests of, of the beneficiaries. In this case, folks in the Data for Black Lives movement, but also the larger black community, 44.6 million black people in this country, right? And using them offers us all a great, um, a much better chance to say um, how our data is collected, 
and how, how it's accessed and how it's also used. And there's, a, there's really some interesting experiments right now happening around deed of trust. Uh, folks in the UK are experimenting with it. Um, people at a group called um, Algorithm Watch that's based in Europe, their approach to data trust is by um, have, is, is creating this like data donation portal where people can donate their YouTube and Facebook data um, for the purposes of building an infrastructure for something like a data trust, all to kind of collectively bring amass our data and again, to have more control and, and decision making power and autonomy over how it's being used, right? And, you know, for us, when, when we hear things like, you know, company, like these genetic testing companies are like, we need more black people's data, so we're going to go on a full-on campaign to make sure that we get folks to, like, sign up for these 23andMe tests uh, to sell it to, like, places like Glasgow Smith & Klein and other pharmaceutical companies. And while we also have groups of people who are doing research on breast cancer, sickle cell, and other really important um, Health, um, 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 you know, health research areas that are underfunded and under-resourced. These are the kind of places that we see ripe for a data trust. And of course, you know, when I made this demand um, for Facebook to hand over their data, our data for public use, I knew that wouldn't happen, at least not immediately. Um, our data, uh, the, the, the data that they've amassed the, of 2.1 billion users is their bread and butter, right? That's how they make money. That is how uh, Facebook is a free platform. Um, but not, right. So, but when I made this demand, I wanted to push into the public imagination um, this idea of what is not only possible, but what we should be expecting of these big tech companies and the fact that they are not like totally, you know, even though they've amassed extreme immense amounts of, of, of capital, um, we also have power and we have to exert that. And so in May 20th, in, in, in this uh, May, and um, this upcoming May, we're actually going to be convening um, people to really build out what our data trust will look like, thinking more deeply about data governance, and also um, creating, a, creating a blueprint for how this data is going to be collected, but also uh, how we're going to be using it amongst our network. And you know, what's the vision for this blueprint? What's the whole point of this? I think data trust is a very important idea, but to what ends, right? And I think for us, um, to, to advance the work of the 4,000 people in our network, right? And to give them the tools, the data, the relationships, and the collective efficacy to make data a tool for social change right where they live. And another program that we launched this year is our Hubs program. And we had piloted this program last year in Washington, D.C. with a group of technologists, activists, and folks um, who have been meeting regularly and, and decided that now was time, given our new staff and hiring a new infrastructure um, that, that we could expand. And we got applications from like all of these places and more. We're not launched, we're not starting with all of these places, but um, it just shows you how many people um, are, are really, really eager to create this kind of space that happens at our conference, but to bring it locally where they live. And you know, these hubs will serve as launch pads for distributed organizing, advocacy initiatives, and most importantly, the deep leadership development, the training of leaders um, with the technical skills, this vision and empathy to make real change right where they live. And finally, the Data for Black Lives Conference is the heartbeat of the movement that we're building. It's not only a laboratory for new ideas around the use of data for social change, but also for experimenting with new ways to build relationships by dissolving silos, and building points of connection to target and dismantle the proliferation of bias through research and technology. And this is happening in December 11, 2020 at the MIT Media Lab. Ooh, yes, I, we announced it last week. So um, registration is opening in August, September. So look out for that. But anyway, to conclude, uh, I want to wrap this up. I leave you all with the question, what are we optimizing? A future where the injustices of the past are automated and reinforced. A past defined by slavery, dehumanization, greed, violence, and control. Or a future vested in justice, fairness, solidarity. A world where all, the, all people's needs are met. Professor Dylan Rodriguez defines abolition as a dream towards futurity vested in insurgent counter-civilizational histories, <coughs> genealogies of collective genius that perform liberation under conditions of duress. Abolition is a process, not an end goal. It is the rejection of prisons as the answers to the world's most pressing social problems. And the process of abolition begins in our minds, 
in our organizations, our academic institutions. It is a new way of understanding the world. According to the Critical Resistance Handbook, abolitionist steps are about gaining ground in a constant effort to radically transform society. They're about chipping away at oppressive institutions rather than helping them live longer. They're about pushing critical consciousness, gaining more resources, building larger coalitions, and developing more skills. And I believe that abolition is against certainty. Abolition is against permanence. The permanence of the prison cell, the guard tower, the weapon, and its factory. Abolition is about asserting life in a system that demands death, casualties, human bodies as its tribute. Abolition is for us right now, while simultaneously being for generations to come. People we may never meet or see, but we must will into existence, just as our ancestors willed us. And I am confident that a new world is possible, a world that we can begin building today, right here and right now. And I invite all of you to join this effort, and I really hope that you can all be a part of our movement and what we're building. Thank you so much. That was a fantastic call to action. And I, I would like to um, just go back to a point you made in the middle of your talk about history and values and, and how important it is to understand data-driven technologies as informed by history and values by when data is collected, where it's collected, who it's collected about, and who is left out. And I just wanted to give you a, a moment to talk a little bit more about that point, because I think it's so central and so um, such a powerful thread through all of your work. Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. I think, you know, when I started Data for Black Lives, like um, so much of my work was actually going back and like reading history. And uh, I mean, we went to Amsterdam and like went back into archives and really learned more about just the evolution of big data from colonialism into what we see now. But I think, you know, especially in the context of the U United States of America um, and in and, and the example of zip code, right? Like we really see how something that it, you know, that was, was used to organize the country around, uh, you know, for, for the postal service has become a way to codify really deep and really persistent and often violent histories that surround housing and that surround exclusion and um, are, are actually used in some places to even define who's what race, right? When I went to Miami and I did this a similar talk, um, you know, in neighborhoods where there were foreign born people, according to what these, uh, the, the history said, um, you know, people who were Cuban were, were defined as either black or as being white, depending on what neighborhood they lived in, regardless of their, you know, complexion or their lineage or whatever, right? And that has persisted to this day. And I think in the current, you know, there's, there's a lot of current examples of how that also plays out. We see so many um, algorithms and automated decision-making processes that, you know, a lot of, I think, researchers and scientists before would believe were like neutral, um, that, you know, they're, they're devoid of history, but um, I always, always invite people to kind of take a step back and to say, what's missing here? What other questions do I need to ask? And like, what is this underlying history that is being reinforced through these algorithms? And again, just because a technology is new doesn't mean that it's innovative and it definitely doesn't mean that it's like beneficial to society. And I think that's also the case with like facial recognition. And I mean, the, the, the examples go on and on and on and on. But that's why we, when we have, when I do these presentations, I use that chart that we, that we made at one of our early retreats, where in addition to the inputs and outputs, there's this big history and this question again of what are we optimizing, right? Um, that's such an important part of the data, data science process. And I think it must be an important part to our everyday practices, whether we're activists, scientists, whomever, so. Great, thank you. So I want to go back to um, the the call for action that Data for Black Lives put out in 2018 following the, the Cambridge Analytica scandal and that, that you talked about a bit here where you asked um, you asked Facebook to to do several things. And one of those things, as you talked about, was to commit to a public data trust. And I think that's, you know, as, as is often the case, um, Data for Black Lives is out in front. I think that conversation now around the creation of data trusts has spread to a lot of different communities. 
And yet it's still a really difficult concept, mm -hmm. I think, for people mm -hmm. to get their heads around the governance of it, how it would work in practice, um, exactly how people would use it. And so I was excited to hear that you're planning um, an event in May to talk this through in mm -hmm. really concrete terms. So I wondered if you could preview that May event for us a little bit and talk about what you think is needed to put that mm -hmm. idea into practice. What, what actually needs to happen from a practical yeah. sense? What are you looking for? Yeah, that's a great question. And you know, we've done so much like internal study as a team to like look at existing examples. Knowing that the data trust that we're envisioning or the one that we needed for this context is, is going to be different, similar but different in a lot of ways. And there is that one piece around the technical aspect, like logistically, what does that actually look like? Where does, where would the data live? Like what would the actual contracts or trust law, so much of data trust, trust right now is based on like actually like 14th century trust law, which is, if you're interested in that, go ahead, please look it up. But, um, but you know, obviously, for us, we're conscious of history and what we're building on and, 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 and how we're um, thinking about our work moving forward. But yeah, I think in addition to that technical and logistical aspect for us, it's what is the advocacy aspect, right? What part of the data trust needs to be about the political action, the advocacy, um, and the self-determination piece, right? You know, for we imagine like, okay, let's say that, you know, what would it look like, for example, for us to replicate what folks in Amsterdam, I mean, Germany did around what was called Open Shufa. Shufa is the name of their kind of FICO credit score algorithm where they literally asked people from across Germany to submit their reports, uh, their, their credit reports for the purpose of amassing it into this big data set and then pulling findings to better understand discrimination. Unfortunately, the, uh, the data set that they got was quite homogenous and they weren't able to recruit enough people of color to actually really totally understand it better. But for me, you know, thinking as an organizer, um, what would it mean to go door to door and talk to folks in communities and say, hey, this is what we're working on. This is uh, what a FICO score is. I, I'm sure you know about it because you're impacted by it. Help us amass this big data set to, for us to better make decisions, right? Or it'll look like this other other advocacy piece, which is, you know, making demands of companies like Facebook or Google or 23andMe or you know these 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 big you know, multinational corporations that have amassed a large amounts of data and have been using it for, you know, not so positive purposes, all the way to the point of, you know, Facebook totally weaponizing that data to change the entire political landscape and create the one that we are currently sitting in. So, you know, there's, there's a different aspect. And that's why for us, we're bringing together people who are really on the front lines of thinking about the legal, technical, how do we actually make something de-identified? Is that possible to anonymize data? To also folks who are working in health and activism who will be really the ones using this data. So um, stay tuned. At our conference in December, we'll be, uh, we're, we're gonna have a whole panel talking about data governance um, and exploring for, for what that means to us. And I mean, even just take a step back, like, you know, we had a whole conversation about what does governance mean, right? And for me, you know, I, this last year, I got a chance to spend a lot of time going into Chiapas, Mexico, and learning from the Zapatista communities, which I learned about when I was growing up in high school and learning how to be an organizer, where, you know, in 1994, a group of indigenous communities came together and protested NAFTA, which was the legislation that kind of pushed forth this whole, uh, and like fortified this whole era of, of neoliberalism, right? It was as if they knew that what was coming, right? They, they could foresee what was coming and how this worldwide legislation would totally change their lives and folks all over the world, right? And for them, their response was to create autonomous communities, which are still in existence today. You know, so maybe you know it's not possible in the US context to do something like that, but how do we think differently about governance? How do we think critically about self-determination? And what does that actually look like? I mean, is that possible? I think so. So Okay, I'm gonna ask one more question. Building off of what you're talking about, that is the idea of governance and what are the different mechanisms for governance. So going back to the, the call for action in 2018, Data for Black Lives also called for, again, out in front, a data code of ethics. Mm -hmm. um, and I think since, since 2018, we've seen that idea picking up mm -hmm. and, and gaining momentum. We've seen normalization of it, but we've also seen pushback 
mm -hmm. on the idea that something like a code of ethics can deliver just mm -hmm. outcomes mm -hmm. for our communities. Right. And so I'm curious where you're where you are on thinking about codes of ethics as a as a powerful governance mechanism, mm -hmm. what they can do and what their limitations are. Yeah, I think that's a good question. You know, there's been lots of, as you said, conversations about ethics and, you know, even uh, the who, who these are being funded by, right? We have lots of companies who have been putting forward their ethics statements and their guidelines. Um, and I think for us, you know, the way that we first practiced this idea of building a code of ethics at our last conference, we actually created like an installation where we had people, well, we, we first asked ourselves like, how do we actually build a code of ethics? Would it make sense to, you know, rent out a room and like have, have people come together and, create a whole like consensus process. But I said, okay, at our next conference, let's have an installation where we have people write and like, you know, reflect on what it means for them, um, what ethics means for them, but also what they commit to and, and what they demand, right? And so we had, we built a cube and maybe for folks who came, you, you remember this, on the outside of the cube was we demand and on the inside was the phrase we commit and people wrote out what they demanded and what they committed to. And I think that was a really important practice for us, again, to kind of build understanding within ourselves of what um, we as a community, you know, are again, holding as demands and what we're committing to. I think for us, you know, in terms of like these larger conversations around code of ethics, yeah, I would agree, you know, that's a cog in the wheel of a larger strategy of like holding these big companies accountable. It has to be paired with, you know, movement building um, to then make sure that that's being actually fulfilled and enforced and materialized. Otherwise, it's unfortunately just like a piece of paper or some values and principles that don't really matter. So, yeah. Great, thank you. Okay, so we'd like to open it up to everyone to ask questions and we can bring you a mic. So if you have a question, please raise your hand and we will bring you the mic. Hi, uh, I had a great great talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, I had a question about because um, you were talking a lot about data governance and sort of who's in control of the data and how the data is sort of stored and manipulated and organized. And I'm curious um, if you also had sort of something to say about just um, when collecting certain forms of data or certain types of data can actually just be fundamentally harmful or when data needs to be deleted. Um, so I'm curious if. You guys have like thoughts about that, especially as it connects to you know data for Black Lives and how collecting certain types of data could just fundamentally be harmful, and how that conversation changes in that context. Yeah, I mean, there's some data that should not exist, right? I think, um, you know, I mean, when I talk, when I say that for far too long, like feminists have been data has has been weaponized against us. Also, like surveillance apparatuses, right? I had a should I talk about this? I had a whole conversation with Manhattan's DA about this open data portal they were trying to make live. And I was like, well, you know, you guys, maybe you shouldn't make all of this data available because private companies, for example, instead of just like advocacy groups, loosely defined, will go onto these data, open databases and find a way to create apps or do whatever and, you know, make money off of them, which will only, which will be double jeopardy to the people who are already, um, you know, have, have faced incarceration or whatever based on these, this data. So, you know, I think there's a lot of different cases, right? And I think for us, you know, we err on the side of, you know, how do we make sure that like, you know, obviously when we're thinking about a data trust, the, the focus is, you know, making demands of, of, of companies who are already using data, being sure about what kind of data we want to use and how do we make those decisions is what are the kind of things and what are the research you know, initiatives and ideas and questions that people in our network are really concerned about, right? I feel like, you know, obviously this question around genetics data is a very important question, but you know, I don't know. I'd rather have my data be used to address sickle cell anemia, black infant mortality, and breast cancer. You, you know, led by you know a group of black women researchers who have been doing this work for a really long time, who are committed to, to the community, who have roots in the community, than like a pharmaceutical company like Glasgow Smith and Klein, right? So I think you know these are the ethical questions, ethical questions that we're really facing. Um, but I think again, for us, the, the focus is.
How do we give people the tools, whether it's young people, like in my experience, to collect their own data, to be in charge of that, um, to to know how to use that, to know how to protect that um, for the purposes of, of, of their communities, right? Um, but yeah, there's so many different ways that data can be weaponized. And I think um, as we push forth in this governance conversation, um, that's a question that we'll continue to grapple with. How would you change the teaching of math and statistics in public schools in order to incorporate the message of abolish big data? That's a really good question. You're gonna have to wait for my book. I'm kidding. No, I mean, I mean, look, like I became really good at data science by having to fight for my life, right? By having to collect data to uplift, you know, the extreme civil and human rights abuses that were happening in my school. That's how I became really good at this, right? Yes, I went to Brown and I learned more about it, and I, you know, had like I was in an IB program and I like was doing like advanced calculus. That was great, but it really didn't. I didn't understand it until I was using it for a purpose that was benefiting me, but most importantly, other people in my community, right? I, you know, we've had conversations with my co-founder, Lucas, who's getting his PhD in math about how we should change calculus education, right? I think, you know, we had a whole panel at our last conference about math education and how math education um, in this country really, if, if you look at the data on math education and you also look at the his history behind it, um, there's there's been a lot of, again, we weaponization of curriculum, there's been a lot of exclusion, but also tons of opportunity um, to do really, really important social justice type work um, with young people. But um, yeah, I have a lot of ideas around that, I think, you know, but I would have to say, first and foremost, like making sure that we're not suspending students for like no reason, that we're creating schools where there's like restorative practices and like non-exclusionary disciplinary policies and you know, where there's opportunities for everybody to learn, where we're funding schools, where we're not shutting down schools, um, and also finding curriculum that is beyond culturally responsive, but that's also empowering people with this knowledge, right? Versus making it like folks feel like, this is math, it's hard, only a small cross-section of society is good at it. No, you know? So, at the very least, yeah. Uh, my question is around what you talked about in terms of value. I think it was really interesting that you brought up the point around um, like the historical context and like value of data and how we're looking at that and the impacts of um, the oppressed and marginalized. And my question is around equity um, in the interim of this path that we have towards abolition. Mm -hmm. And um, whether or not you think there's space for a shift of ownership mm -hmm. when it comes to data, when it comes to the profit around data. Um, and what do you believe is necessary for our communities to know to be able to champion that type of equity and ownership? That's a great question. Yeah, I think that's a great question. You know, with the data trust idea, you know, people have been saying that that's a good ownership avenue because some examples of data trust involve people actually pooling their data and being able to profit, or maybe their individual big data sets and, and being able to profit. I don't think that's the same as what you're asking in terms of ownership. I think, you know, for us, um, you know, ownership would look like being able to make sure that the data that is about us is actually being used um, by us and also for the purposes of, you know, the issues, context, problems, solutions that are surrounding our lives, right? And that's, when I say us, I, I mean black communities. People have been doing in really interesting experiments around data cooperatives, um, and I think that is one avenue and one solution that, that, that could also work as well, data trust, data cooperatives. Um, and I think this larger question around like education and how do we, how do we get people from one place to the other? I think about this a lot because, you know, when we say making data a tool for social change instead of a weapon of political oppression, like, that's a cultural change. Like, that's a consciousness shift, right? And I experienced in so many, so many spaces, especially, you know, folks who are like, yeah, like, I, you know, folks in, in black communities, people who have never, who don't know what an algorithm is, who don't know what predictive police, like a uh, predictive algorithm is or what big data is, but they understand FICO because it's had such an important influence in their lives, right? They understand compass risk assessment scores because inherently it's impacted them. Like I had experiences going on Capitol Hill and I'm explaining something like a FICO algorithm to some so to like senators and they understand and, and you know, explaining it the same way as I would to my grandma and my grandma 
grandma gets it more because she's so much closer and so much more directly impacted. And I think for us, you know, we really are, you know, so focused on like, how do we talk about these issues in a way that is obviously accessible, that's obviously in inclusive, but most importantly empowering, and that is pushing people's imaginations, right? That's why even though we're not totally sure what a data trust looks like, we're gonna push these demands, right? You know, because that, that is what takes people from, oh, like, my data is being taken and used in an election all the way to, okay, wow, this is how we can actually flip the script and do something totally different and make this about empowerment and make this about um, autonomy and self-determination. And um, I lost my train of thought about what else I was going to say. But yeah, you know, this is, this is why we kind of do this work and this is why, um, you know, public education and this main principle at Data for Black Lives, which is, really about using this datafication of our society to make like bold demands, maybe not totally new demands, but like bold demands for racial justice, right? So many of the things we are asking for now are like not new, but we have an opportunity that with the exposure of these problems and a new way of looking at it. But yeah, that was a great question around ownership and um, equity. Thank okay. you. Thank you everybody.